Hi, I'm Sabrina Medora, national food writer and founder of Unplated. I'm here today with Chef Brad Weiss of the Trust Restaurant Group. Hi, Brad. Hi, how are you? Good. Thank you so much for having me in. Absolutely. Thanks for coming. Uh, so, Brad, I'm pretty new to San Diego, as you know, and one of the first recommendations someone ever gave me was you have to try any of the Trust restaurants. So I thought, okay. And my little story is that when we were moving into our home, I think I've told you this before, but my husband and I ordered from Fort Oak. Uh -huh. We ordered your ribeye, your bone marrow butter, and your cavatelli and just a bunch of sides. And it was going to be our first night in the new house. And then we picked everything up, and in the chaos of moving, we forgot that we had picked up all this food. <laughs> Fast forward two and a half hours, and we realized we don't have any we don't have any oven, we don't have any way to heat the food up, we don't have a microwave. I was like, still smells really good, let's just try it cold. <laughs> I have to tell you, that cold ribeye was actually one of the best pieces of meat I've ever eaten. Well, thank you. It's phenomenal, phenomenal. Chef Brad is excellent at meats, but his secret weapon is actually all the vegetables that you guys do. Yeah, we've been, uh, I would think we were a meat-centric group. Right. Um, and, you know, we, we do a lot of live fire cooking. So um, it, for some reason, and, and I guess it's just because of, of the way we treat and respect vegetables, that, that it became one of our focuses at all of our locations now. Well, thank God for that. Yeah. They're amazing. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about you as a chef. So prior to Trust Restaurant Group, what were you doing? I was the corporate executive chef for a restaurant group by the name of Eat, Drink, and Sleep. It was a hotel okay. um, or a hospitality company um, right here in San Diego. I worked for them for about nine and a half years, uh, all the way up from a pantry cook to the corporate executive chef. Um, lived in Bakersfield for a stint, and then you know my latest book, Prior to Trust Restaurant Group, I was at Belmont Park Entertainment, and then oh, fun. yeah, so they were partners on that, and um, so and then I, I reconcepted and helped get all those places open. Went back to Jordan uh, Tower Twenty Three, where I originally started when I moved out here. Okay. I worked there for four and a half years prior to going to Bakersfield, and then you know I, I got to a point, um, and I, I was I was like I, I want to try something on my own. Um, teamed up with uh, with a partner, and you know, then came took us you know two two and a half years to get open after the start of the conversation of, of what trust was going to be. You know, we didn't even have a name. We went through a few different names, um, and then you know, we just want we knew we wanted to create a, a, a culture and and something special. Mm -hmm. um, you know, an investor took a leap of faith on us, and you know, here we are with. Uh, a decent sized company. Yeah. Uh, after that, five spots. Five spots. Right. With well, seven, but two of them are building right okay. now. So uh, we have another steakhouse being built and another butcher shop up in North County being built. So of course you're the meat guy. You've got you know a steakhouse by the name of Rare Society. You've got lovely steaks here at Fort Oak. You've got steak on the Trust menu. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you have an awesome steak on the Cardolino menu. Yeah. Then you have your amazing butchery, the Wise Ox. Yeah. Tell me how those iterations are different at each spot. So, so I'll, I'll explain them in the in the the open um, as we open them. Trust was a restaurant where we wanted to enjoy the things we like to enjoy when we go out to dinner. You know, my wife and I are who members some friends. Um, you know, and it's kind of not the, not the top of style of dining, which I always enjoy that, but just, you know, share plates. You know, we recommend two to three dishes per person, so the, the, the server's giving you their entire, you, you know, the rundown of how we like to do things. So we wanted to, and at the time, when we were starting Trust, there was nothing like it in San Diego. So we were like, we're gonna start this restaurant. This is what we wanna do. Obviously, everyone was like, you're stupid, don't do it, you know, and then of course we, you know, my business partner at the time was, you know, he's like, hey, whatever you want to do, I'm going to support you, you know, it's like, I, I believe in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So we, we kept our foot on the throttle and, you know, then again, trust was born with, with that idea of the share plate. Uh, a couple other restaurants at that time just opened after us that gave us some sort of validation. Now, have you, we went into this as I was a corporate executive chef for an amusement park in a, mm -hmm. in a sense. I didn't know anything. I still don't know anything, but I didn't know what I was doing. I knew, I thought I knew how to cook and, and all of these things. And, you know, my business partner had, you know, a longer restaurant history than I did. 
So then we get into it, and then you know we got momentum after finally after 18 months of you know really really hard times. We, we opened a destination restaurant in the middle of Hillcrest. The destination restaurant thing was non-existent, you know, for the five prior years to trust opening. You right. know, and that's what kind of gave us our our footing of trust redefines destination dining, and. That was like, I, I'll never forget, it was like our first article that kind of like made us stick with people. And uh, so and then after that, you know, we had a couple opportunities after that. We, we opened a bar concept for a short while, then quickly turned that into Rare Society, the steakhouse. Mm -hmm. um, that approach is, my wife is from Santa Maria, which is in the central coast of wood fire. And that's where the wood fire thing really kind of stems from is her family grew up in the central coast eating, eating over red oak. Um, in Santa Maria style barbecue. So that's where the seed really started for me. And then I just kind of just took it, you know, to a couple different levels from there. I always wanted a steakhouse and I wanted a different casual approach, but still sophisticated at the same time. Right. You know, we, we, they tell you never, you know, you don't put a Wagyu steak on wood fire. You know, why? You know, there's no reason, rhyme or reason behind it. It's just saying you're disrespecting the meat. We don't disrespect anything. You know, the product is the most focused thing we have in the group. So. Um, you know, I just like to, I'm always challenging myself and people, they tell me that I can't do something, so I'm probably going to do it. You're um, just gently pushing boundaries. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and then, you know, after Rare Society or during Rare Society, Fort Oak was, um, we, we had opened the location we're standing in right now. So with the building that Trust is in, um, that architect built this building as well, Jonathan Siegel. They told us right when we opened Fort Oak, hey, we got this really cool place in Mission Hills. When they were explaining this and you know how it is. There's a bar in the, or there's a round building in the center that used to be a dealership, and then we built a restaurant around it. And you're like, hold on, yeah, like, what are you talking about? Like that, that makes no sense. So anyway, at that point, it was just framing. Finally, it got to the point where you could see like the bones of the place, where there was actual walls and things like that. And then we came to look at it, and this was a year and a half after they said it to us. Um, and then we. We walked in here and we we're like, man, this place could have something special. It's different. Logistically, it's difficult for us, but the guests, I think it, you know, it's it's unique because you have a bar in the center, a patio, a dining room, and then the kitchen. It's all detached. Mm -hmm. We have obviously the corridors that, that we use, but it's it's just a different layout. And for this neighborhood, it was perfect. After we saw the corner that was on, the way that the building really opened up, and then the kitchen was ideal for me. It was a perfect box with nothing else in there. And you're like, okay, now you get to build the kitchen of your dreams yeah. in, in this in this box and put a chef's tasting menu counter there. And it was like every, anything, you know, every chef's dream to be able to build something like that. And then we kept with the with the um, the wood fire theme and just kind of elevated it. Um, and then, you know, that's where the name Fort Oak came from was Red Oak Wood, what we cook over. We're on Fort Stockton Drive. The building is called the Fort, so there was like kind of a lot of signs for us. Okay. Um, and then, you know, again, I, I this restaurant, the success of it was obviously the people. You know, we have we have a ton of amazing staff that works for this group. So there was people that came from, um, at the time, 100 Proof uh, Trust that were had been there for two and a half years that were like looking for something different. That general manager moved over here. Uh, we brought on another sh a local chef from the, um, in, in the city that wanted to move up and was, you know, had been at the restaurant he was at for a while. And then it just, the pieces kind of just fell together. Um, and then again, Fort Oak was born and then now we're in Mission Hills mm -hmm. and then we get an opportunity to, uh, another landlord approaches us for um, Cardolino, which is our Italian concept. And it was a, we needed a bakery. We have, we do everything in house from, Know, sourdoughs to all the desserts everything's here well that takes up a large footprint and we were looking for a bakery location so then Cardolino or the previous Brooklyn girl came and became available and they made a, again a deal that we couldn't refuse so that's where we put our bakery and things like that I'm from South Jersey so you being from East Coast you understand the Italian influence that we have it's not real Italian you know that's why <laughs> I'm clear when I say it's American Italian, right. but it's what I grew up making. But know. it's people. It's something that people can easily identify with. It's the comfort food. You know, it's it's carbs, it's yes. cheese, it's red sauce, it's meat. Like you can't really go wrong there. No, yeah, and everyone, you know, back east, it, Italian restaurants are full every day. Yeah. You know, it's like it's just something that you you, you always gravitate towards. 
and we had been wanting to do an Italian concept for a while, and especially me, and it was, it had all the bones for it, and then we wanted a bakery, so we kind of just meshed them all together, and mm -hmm. we did the daytime, daytime concept, yeah. uh, cafe bakery by day, and then uh, Italian eatery by night, and then then we opened that five weeks before the pandemic started. It was a great time to open. Um, <laughs> and then during the pandemic, uh, actually right the first shutdown, I ran into the one of the business partners of of the previous Heart and Charter. Okay. Um, and that's when the seed for the Wise Ox started. Was I ran into him in March. He, he and his business partner, something had happened with him. Um, I don't remember what it was, and he was like, "Hey, I want." He was in pharmaceutical sales. He's like, "I don't want to be in the restaurant business. Buy this restaurant for me, or buy the heart and trotter for me." And I'm like, uh. "Ironically, I had um, one of the guys who was the opener um, was on work with us already, and then the general manager for almost two years was is our line director now." Okay. And then I started talking to him. Hey, we got this offer. They, you know push me to do it, you should do it, you should do it. So then we did it, and next thing you know, the Wise Ox was born. Uh, we opened that in August of, in the middle of the pandemic. It was like the, I did it for a couple of reasons. A, because we like that brand, and we like butcher shops. I'm much more intrigued with the retail side of the business now mm -hmm. um, than I was previously. And again, it was something I didn't know, and it was another challenge. And not only that, it was a, like, hey, I'm gonna buy this place, so, I can staff more people through, you know, through this pandemic, and so we did that, and it, we, we've gotten loved by the locals, you know, by just the sandwich execution and just the product that we're able to serve in our restaurants and, right. and explain the cooking techniques and things to that, and you get to have that interaction with people. It's something special that, that we like. So that's kind of the long-winded rundown. <laughs> of the group. I mean, you've done a lot in the last <laughs> what six. Five and a half years? Five and a half years. That's insane. Yeah. In five and a half years, you've opened and successfully run five concepts, two more coming up, pretty quickly on your timeline, I'm yes. guessing. It is quick. Yeah. It is quick. But when you, you get, we can do everything with the people around us. And right. I'll go back, you know, people ask me, you're crazy, you're, you, you do this. I'm like, I'm not afraid to, A, I'm not afraid to take a risk. B, if you believe in the people that are around you that, and, and try to bring out the best in them, Feel like I'm good with, with, with talking with people and, and knowing their strengths and mm -hmm. maybe they don't even know it yet. But mm -hmm. just trying to guide and people talk and I listen. I feel like that's where I got, you know, far early in my career. The previous company there'd be a lot of people conversations I had no business being in, but they were wanted to talk. If someone's willing to talk, I should be able to listen right. and and respect to listen and just hear what they have to say. So, uh, you know, and I took a gamble on some people. And, and, you know, it, uh, we try to do as best as we can with what we got. So I, I believe in the people that work for us, and that they are the ones that allow me to, uh, us to grow, you know, because they're putting the dedication in as well. Right. That's amazing. Um, going back to the Wise Ox uh -huh. really quick, what a perfect concept for the pandemic. I mean, hate to say it, but butcher shop, quick service sandwiches, excellent marinated meats, like there were weeks where I just did not want to look at my stove, yep. did not want to stomach the idea of having to come up with another breakfast, another lunch, another dinner. And here you've got a whole freezer full of like freshly marinated, come and grab it, chicken drumettes, the tri-tip, you know, I mean, fantastic. Yeah, we did. And that was our reasoning for it was when when the pandemic hit and the butcher or the, the market sold out of everything, you know, all your local supermarkets, Everyone was out of everything. Everybody turned to your local butcher again. They didn't mind paying two to three dollars extra steak or four dollars extra steak because they saw the quality that they were getting. Myself included, right? You know, and was I obviously sometimes shop at the restaurants, but you know it was the, the consist consistency in sandwiches, which coming from the East Coast, every butcher shop mm -hmm. we don't really. I even when I opened it, I asked my mom, I'm like. Did we ever buy meat from you know steaks from our supermarket? And she's like, not really. We always went to the butcher shop. Yeah. You know the local butcher shops that we had. So it was like a natural thing for me growing up. And out here, it just really didn't exist. It did, but just it wasn't that many of them. Right. Um, so that was kind of, I think, what the pandemic did. It helped that. 
people realize like, hey, I can pay a little bit more for quality meat. I'm gonna feel better after I'm done eating it, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna enjoy it a lot more. You know, be it chicken, pork, or beef. Yeah. Um, and then being able to fun, you know, throw fun marinades on it. Um, the sandwiches are, you know, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel on our sandwich program. We just want to have well executed um, uh, and flavorful sandwiches. Mm-hmm. You know, and it was something that people were extremely happy with. You know, in, in the daytime thing, and the sandwich business is still really strong. Absolutely. I mean, it's so easy to just hop in for lunch. I've done it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe got a burger along the way yeah. and then took a nap. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it's 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 smart. Um, I wrote an article during the pandemic about how the prices of meat were skyrocketing mm-hmm. and what chefs were trying to do about that. I'm really curious, how did you manage to get so much great access to meat when there was such a shortage? Um, well, we have a lot of great partnerships along the way with uh, purveyors. Mm-hmm. I do... I'm definitely a person who obviously wants the highest grade of product. However, I buy from people at the end of the day. Right. You know? So they, if you stick with companies long enough, they kind of move you up the, the ladder a little bit. I'm loyal to a default sometimes. Um, so usually when anyone from our group is looking for something, it's, I hate to say it like this, but it's sometimes maybe be easier for other people to get it just because of, the, the, the loyalty that we've had to that company for, sure. for, for so long. So it's, you know, it, that was the way. However, the prices did go up for us as well. Right, you yeah. Know, so, and even now in the short, just, you know, a few weeks ago, the prices did another bump over the last 45 days have gone up increasingly high. However, we can't match what they've gone up. Some are up 50, 60, 70%. Mm-hmm. We can't go up that high. No. We just have to be a little bit smarter. Maybe you don't sell this one and then you, you push lean a little bit more towards pork and poultry right. and just get creative and people do come in they're like man your prices really went up honesty is our best virtue you know hence why the company's trust is yeah hey this is what it is our prices are going up this high we're not making any extra money at this point we are just trying to i can't bring it if something goes up 75 percent, i can't charge you 75 percent no. inflation in on right. It, right so i mean thinking about the sandwich cost alone if your beef is going up 75 yeah. percent and your regular sandwich is a 12 dollar sandwich yeah. and you want to keep the same beef in there we sometimes and we know when there's a spike you just sometimes you have to eat that cost yeah and we actually didn't move any prices of our sandwiches you know just because you get a little bit more creative with things and mm-hmm. not necessarily use different product or anything but we just had to do it a little bit different was all. You yeah. Know, we, we, certain aspects of the business we can keep the same because others got better and we got smarter over here that compensated for this side. So and that's kind of what our what, what our model is. We just try to maneuver around so we don't price gouge and value. Perceived value is everything to me and this group. So mm-hmm. we just try to make sure we're being as fair as possible. Right. I think trust is such a great way to describe your spaces, not just because it's the name of the restaurant group, but... I always say to people, it's like, you're going to have a really trustworthy experience mm-hmm. of food there because I know if I'm coming for your Sun Chokes at Trust restaurant, I know that they're going to be the same amount of perfection every time, even though, of course, it's not like a chain restaurant where you're just churning sure. it all out. And now you're talking to me about honesty with customers and pricing. And in a way, it's really great for customer education. Yes. I mean, the pandemic has been a huge lesson for customers yes. on how restaurants function because we're starting to expose the fact that restaurants are actually a very um, delicate balance yeah. and it could crumble in a second. What do you think, um, how do you perceive diners reacting towards restaurants in the future versus what you saw of them pre-pandemic? I think, I think that the restaurant diner has given us a little bit of leeway in a mm. sense. Obviously, we know everyone in the country struggling with staffing issues and we we noticed when we reopened this last time back in february that you know it's okay if you're not perfect every day you know if we're if a server stretch a little bit too far that's starting to wear off now though yeah. people are kind of reverting back to the way they were before okay um, we're starting to see that in probably the last month however some people are starting to come out of the woodwork and we're getting you know a little bit more staff um in, in the, you know, during the pandemic, and I, I, we're still in one, but, you know, towards the end of us being in shutdown, everyone was a little bit more lenient. However, people, majority of the people are 
I'm sorry, you guys have gone through a lot because we were in the media all the time. They right. understood the low margins, how much work they went into it, the hours, and people, it was a reset for people. You know, there was, it was the restaurant industry, which, you know, I can think of a number of articles now that it was like, okay, the restaurant, you know, the restaurant bubble has to burst at some point, right. you know, like right. people all over New York Times, everyone was doing their articles about it. And this was like the burst, you know, it was like, okay, now 30% of restaurants are closed. Now the good ones are hopefully still around and, mm -hmm. and you, you need to, we need to get back to where we can execute. We need to get back to where we can execute. So people because there's less restaurants around, we need to execute and make sure people are getting their perceived value and the experience that we obviously want to deliver to them. So, right. you know, it's a, I think this made everyone a better restaurant operator and hopefully a better diner at this point. Realize that, you know, that <laughs> maybe if, if something, and I explain this to people in the kitchen all the time, if this dish takes an extra 30 seconds for it to be perfect, the, the, the diner can wait. Right. You know, hopefully they respect that to, as well. It was right. a hard thought behind it. Right. I think that's great. Um, what's in store for Trust Restaurant Group? Um, th what's in store for Trust Restaurant Group is, I've always said it, the sky's the limit. Um, I try to, I'm not really a person that goes out and says, oh, I'm going to look for this or I'm going to look for that. Usually when we have the people and it's like, okay, I, I really like this person or whoever that I meet and they're like, Hey, you know, I want to come work with you or do whatever. Then usually it starts the seed of, okay, well now I'm going to go look for this. Or I'm going to go look for that. Mm -hmm. um, we're really loving the steakhouse brand. I really love the butcher shop brand. Um, but also there's, you know, if there's a, a, a scratch or an itch that I have to scratch, sometimes I do it. There's a number of concepts that I always wanted to have, um, or type of concepts that I want to have. There's one more in particular that I don't, so I'm always looking for that right, you know, that right location to, to open it. So, uh, you know, again, the sky's the limit. Do you think you'll go national eventually? Um, with possibly with a brand, mm -hmm. a brand in particular. Like the Wise um, Ox or something like that. No? I think more of the Steakhouse brand. Okay. Um, Rare Society is unique in the sense of you have really high tiers of Steakhouse mm -hmm. and then you have your kind of chain steakhouses, yep. there's nothing in the in middle between. Right. that is fun, hip, and and executed. Mm -hmm. um, we did a lot of market research. There's a million phenomenal good steakhouses um, around the country. However, what we have that I think we have is, is we have a different approach to a lot of things. What people may not have been thinking about when they scaled, we're already doing. Now it's, it's, it's the time, and again, that all of these things that I'm trying to vaguely say is what we learned during the pandemic of yeah. like, hey, this, this was, we worked really hard to everything to get taken away from you, rightfully so, to get taken away from you in two months, you yeah. know, to see you were like at square, at zero, you're like, I, I can't do this again, you know, so that, there's some things that changed for me, of maybe I don't have the coolest concept in San Diego all the time, but if I can keep the restaurants we have good, relevant, and, and people keep coming back, I win. Yeah. And then let's focus on, you know, making retirements for everyone in the company. That's what's important to me now. Amazing. I will say your point about the steakhouses is so interesting. Um, I'm sure you saw this past Friday. I <laughs> ordered from Rare Society. Mm -hmm. And it, it was actually like a, a fight with my husband because I was like, I really want to go to a steakhouse tonight for dinner. He's like... We've lived in Chicago, we've lived in D.C., and you have never wanted to go to a steakhouse as much as you constantly talk about this steakhouse. I'm like, well, you've just never been to Rare Society. Mm -hmm. They just do something differently. And I couldn't articulate what it was, but you're so right. I kind of feel like I can come in my casual yep. wear, like a T-shirt and jeans, or not even jeans, because who wants to deal with sure. those ever again? <laughs> And, you know, just like your executive board, Rare Society does this amazing concept where it's just a board full of steak and it's all the different kinds of steak and it's got, and then you've got your beautiful sides, your mac and cheese, your um, snap peas, yeah. the Parker house rolls, the lobster, and it's just fun. Yeah. You've made a steakhouse feel fun. Yeah. And I love that. Well, well thank you. And that was, that was our approach um, of having everything well executed and, and casual at the same time. And, you know, not to say that we're not going to have a little bit more of a higher end version and a casual end, uh, version, depending on what location we go in. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's, 
I stayed away from the steakhouse brand, steakhouse in general for a long time. Yeah. Until the seed started of you know where my wife's from and all of this stuff and going to the steakhouses that are extremely casual where mm -hmm. she's from. And then going to ones that are, you know, around here or in Chicago or New York, and mm -hmm. you're like, man, there has to be something in the middle here. Three hundred and fifty bucks a head is not. Yeah. You don't need to be paying this for a steakhouse. Right. Nor do you need to pay twenty dollars. Right. Somewhere in the middle that you can find common ground and make it fun. And then the associate and executive board is what we did. And then the next one we're opening is kind of a, a emphasis on those boards and bringing the cocktail and wine side mm -hmm. of it into it. So. This allows us to have fun with a steakhouse, like we have all of our other concepts, at the same time be familiar. Yeah. You know, and, and people that come, they dig it. So, you know, not everybody, of course, but we 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 think we have something special here. You know, we're we're putting putting a lot on it. So a lot of work into it. Rare Society Solana Beach mm -hmm. is the new one. Correct. And then um, can we talk about the other concept or is it still yeah, okay. the Wise Ox? Uh, oh, is that what the oh, second one no. is? Oh, no. The one I was talking about. Yes. No. Okay. Not yet. <laughs> well, it's we'll just not have all, to come back. Yeah, it's not all, it's in my head it's done, but right. it just has to be the right location, has to be the right everything. Okay, so it, it really hasn't really even begun yet. No. Okay. No, 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 no. Not, not a location, nothing. Okay. It is just a concept that I want to be able to check off in a box. Got that, it. That so is. we'll have to stay tuned for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it'll be very exciting, I promise. Excellent. Um, final question, since mm -hmm. we're at Port Oak, you mentioned earlier that when you saw the space, you saw the potential of building a chef's dream kitchen. Yes. Tell me about that kitchen. Um, so that kitchen is a, I've never worked in kind of the traditional French kitchens where they have the islands and things in the middle. However, in the beginning, we didn't design it that way. I did it differently, had things. Anyway, the engineers came back and like, Brad, this is not going to work. This is some of our options, you know, and then. They're like, hey, I want you to look at these these suites. I'm like, okay, well, that sounds amazing. Um, so then we start laying this thing out, and it's like, and they're like, you can put anything anywhere you want, and this is how we'll tie it together. And then we did that, and then as Fort Oak Kitchen was a giant custom, you know, wood burning grill. Each service and each station has its own area. Everything is flows from one side to the next, right to the pass. There's a raw bar on one end, and then there's diners that can sit all the way around. I mean, that was like the dream kitchen with everything all prep, everything being in one room. The hardest thing I found when I was growing up and when I first became a chef is the chefs lose so much focus on everything around them because everyone puts a prep room over here. They do all these things over here. Well, the chef only expos. That was like the last thing I wanted. I'm like, I want to be able to see everything. I want to be able, all of my chefs are behind the line expos. So we don't ever stand out in front of the line. You know, we, we, we're always the ones touching the last bit of the food. And then we hire an expo who has the same appreciation for what we do. And, and we were able to create that amazingly here. You know, you come to this kitchen and you go to like my first restaurant, Trust, it's like, <laughs> Jeez, what were you doing? You know, but obviously this is a much larger location. It's almost double the square footage, so right. that's all relative. But it's just you learn a little bit with each location that you build. Um, so this was like a like a dream kitchen. And the first thing people do, like when they come in to work here, they're like, "Oh my gosh, like, <laughs> I know." Make sure you don't slam those doors too much. Right. So instead of a job application or job posting, you'll just put a picture of the yeah. kitchen and be like, now hiring. There, now hiring. Well, before <laughs> it worked really easy. Now it's a little bit more challenging. Right. We're getting back, though. Well, thank you so much, Chef, for having us. Thank we you. really appreciate it. Likewise. And um, looking forward to seeing what's next. Thank you.